I sort of am going to share with you uh, questions and issues that might straddle this panel as well as the last one. And I think Alfredo already touched upon questions and issues that frame the informal city, that, that frame what I call the kinetic city, and this is something we share and argue about. Uh, and uh, I think in the South and Latin, or the Southern American condition and the Indian condition, of course there are differences. Uh, I think the Indian slums, as we call them, or the informal city is far more productive. Uh, I think 30%, 50% of Mumbai, for example, lives in what we call informal cities, and 30% of that city is actually a site of production. So these are incredibly vital and um, potent places. Uh, and I think in the last panel there were a number of issues that were very, very interesting. Lean architecture, uh, common sense, uh, the questions of employment and uh, uh, bringing jobs, etc. And so what I'm going to do is actually look at this condition but extract from it what has inspired me as an architect and share a few projects with you. The statistics are mind-boggling. They've been sort of in different ways thrown, been thrown around uh, in the morning. But it, it's mind-boggling to think that in 30 or 40 years, 3 billion people are going to live in what are sort of informal uh, settlements. And this is just absolutely uh, staggering. Uh, and I think we have to therefore pay attention to even terminology. I think third world, the south, I think that's all out. What we are talking about is the majority world. That is the new definition, because this is where a majority of the world's population is going to live. And this was invented by someone in Bangladesh, and it's absolutely appropriate because it challenges all these notions. It challenges even setting up the binaries between the first, second, third world. Uh, and I think this is a much more potent uh, kind of uh, definition, which also highlights in a sense, implicitly, the kind of equities, inequities that exist in our society. And if you look at just the case of India, for example, we are going to have 393 cities, uh, which are 100,000 people, and in the next 20 or 30 years, these are going to become 1 million people. So about 4 million people are going to live in cities in India that even I would struggle to name more than 10. And this is outside anyone's imagination, between, because between the seven mega cities, which is Mumbai, Kolkata, Chennai, all of that, and the 28 tier 2 cities, we would cover whatever is in our imagination today. So there are going to be 400 million people in that massive country who are going to live in places we don't even know about. And therefore, how do we rejig education? How do we reorient our attitude to the city uh, for a city that won't be produced through grand vision. These will be cities that will grow incrementally. Uh, and I think, therefore, the lessons, the labs, the sites of the kinds of places that Alfredo was talking about are very critical, because otherwise you're going to land up in what we have now, which are these immense inequities uh, that exist. That's the world's biggest house, and this is the world's smallest sort of occupation of space by families and by people. And these contrasts sort of set themselves up in places like Mumbai. In the last two decades, all celebrated architecture globally has pandered to what I call uh, impatient capital. Everything has been responding to impatient capital, and therefore we're getting an architecture of indulgence and of luxury. And this is critical because we celebrate this in conditions of autocracy, not even democracy. And so we don't even challenge the political ideology when we celebrate this architecture. And interestingly, the debates about sustainability have actually been folded into this impatience, and thus has become one of quick fixes. Uh, quick fixes are basically mechanical and chemical fixes to problems that have been created. So you create the problem, you respond to this, and then it's a chemical and mechanical fix. And lead, for example, actually blesses this approach. And so it's interesting for me, as someone who's been practicing for 20 years from a context outside here, and then working here, and with Transolar, we've failed in some of the attempts, and I've understood that they are because of cultural attitudes. It's an important question to also look at, because our focus, our energy, our invention, is residing in this architecture of impatient capital, which is limiting what we are doing. So for example, common sense, how do you make lean buildings? This is not even uh, part of the debate. And in fact, lead for me is emblematic of this condition because the idea of an intelligent building is premised on mechanical fixes, not the designer's intelligence. And I think this is something we've got to be really acutely aware of. The debate has also been preempted by the high techs. 
And so the idea of what I call thinking locally, but having the power to act globally. And this is a complete inversion. We have to challenge that in terms of the questions if we have to maximize impact. And so therefore, it's not grand visions, but it's grand adjustments. It's incremental grand adjustments. And I think this is something that can play an interesting role. So for example, in Mumbai, I always use this example. This is the cricket field. This is a wonderful game. Uh, we call it an Indian game that was invented by the British. Uh, and uh, it's sort of these fields exist all over Mumbai. And in the evenings, they become venues for weddings. So instead of building large halls where weddings could happen and investing in infrastructure, this is a temporal landscape. And it's a wonderful relationship, even socially, because a cricket pitch no one touches, it's sacred ground. The members of the club sit here, the kitchen is set up, the wedding uses the kitchen, they get samosas, you have high tea, everyone benefits by the morning, it disappears, the cricketers play there. It only lasts for a few hours, it touches the ground lightly, but it, it is big infrastructure in terms of who it accommodates. And so then, you have conditions like this. So what is the role of the architect when you see something like this? And Matthias in his introduction talked about mass design, who are students of ours, his and mine, and how they sort of went and made design awareness within governments. And so similarly here, we've been working with this condition of the slums of Mumbai. This is the edge of Dharavi. And what struck me was amazing that a place like that produces children like this who get up every morning and go to school with white socks, clean shirts, and they're totally intact as people. And the facilities in terms of sanitation is crazy. According to the UN, UN report, it's one toilet, that is one WC, for 1,440 people. It's just totally mind-boggling, and that child comes out of that condition. The NGOs in Mumbai say it's one is to 100. The Bombay Municipal Corporation says it's one is to 150. The BMC is wanting to target one is to 50. So even the aspiration is not to make it one is to one, which is mind-boggling. There is no design input at all in this. The toilets that are created are created like that. No architects are involved. They're never used because they're so badly designed. They're not embedded in the, in the community. So we've been working and we convinced an NGO to evolve a new toilet uh, type. And what we essentially did was we wrapped a green wall around it, not as a green wall, but as a ventilating device to change the association of the toilet with flowers. We also put the caretaker's house on top of the toilet because the caretaker is from the lowest caste. And now he gets the penthouse in the slum. And attached to that, we made a community space. I got a a client of mine who I was doing an expensive house for us to donate the solar panels, and now we have this off the grid. Because in the public toilets, the contractors who make money from it, they take the bulbs out so they can save electricity. But now that it's off the grid, the children can study there at night, the women can do educational classes there at night. It's totally the community space now. It becomes an icon in the community, so you kind of reverse what's happening. We've had all sorts of problems in making it happen, and I'll tell you that, or we can discuss it, but that's how it gets embedded in the community. It becomes a community center. We've built one of them. There are eight under construction that were stopped by the government, and we can discuss these problems. We are now trying to evolve how, for different parts of the country, using local technologies, you can sort of ex you can expand this as a typology, which then could be embedded in those communities with shops, with community centers. So it blurs. It doesn't become a freestanding object uh, that is sort of looked at in a, with a completely different relationship. And in this one, the children already use it. They have space. The solar panels become iconic in many ways. They study there, and you can see what the government is doing in the background, because they're building public housing. They're going back to the 1960s. So this challenges that paradigm, and these become actually institutions uh, within these sort of landscapes. Uh, and that's part of the problem, which I'd like to discuss maybe during our discussion period. But I just also want to make you aware that, as Matthias um, the Saarbrook said, that it's, it's the, the small interventions can be aggregated, and that's one solution. But I think we, it's, it's not mutually exclusive to the larger vision. And we have to look at infrastructure, how it's deployed, how metropolitan areas are looked at, how transportation is deployed in interesting ways. These have to go hand in hand. They're not exclusive. If we set up the binaries, we don't find the solutions. And Christian Worthman, my colleague at Harvard, sort of came up with this wonderful chart, which is denial, which is the phases we went through in the 60s. Eradication was in the 70s. Tolerance was something government 
departments engaged with in the 80s. In the 90s, you began improvement, upgrading slums. Now we have to anticipate as a community. We have to look forward. And if you have to anticipate, then it means working across the two scales. And that collaboration is totally critical. So for another project, we were approached by the government of Rajasthan. And this is my client, who is a Mahut. These are usually Muslims. They are very badly treated in Jaipur, because Jaipur is a right-wing Hindu government. And this is a Mahut and the elephant. The Mahut earns about 5,000 rupees a month, which is like less than $100. They're extremely poor. And so we were asked to come up with a scheme for a low-cost housing project for them, uh, for the elephant and their keeper, because there are 100 elephants uh, in Jaipur that take tourists up. And this was the site we were given, which was a site that was basically quarried by sand contractors. So it was unbuildable. And so we said, let's not privilege, privilege the architecture. We thought that elephants are tropical beings. They shouldn't be in a desert climate. Jaipur is a desert. They're, this is an accident of history that the, the kings bought them there for ceremony. And so we said, how do you actually, in a, in a desert climate, create a climate appropriate for elephants. And so we came up with this scheme of using the pits that the sand quarrying contractors had made to trap water, to identify local species. Uh, and that was what the site was like when we got it. It was completely just sand, because that's why it had been quarried. This was the scheme. So we said, let's set up the water systems. Now, of course, the government, the public works department were not interested in the landscape. There are no kickbacks in landscape. It's very little. By collecting water, no one's going to pay them. But by building all the houses, they get a lot of Back. So they just went and built the houses. Luckily, the government fell, and we managed to convince them to dig a few holes, which over two years when the project was on hold, started filling up with water and changing the ecology. And now the government is actually running after us to finish the project because it sort of got so much attention. And this is a complete reversal. So this was the scheme. Uh, this is the logic, the land landscaping. The houses we designed with great care. They're only 200 square feet houses, but by creating a hierarchy of court Courtyards, we actually triple the size of the house because they can actually use the outside areas. And then using Photoshop, we're trying to convince, convince the government what a difference the landscape would make. And that's what a site visit looked like. Elephants can't sleep on flat land, so they have to sleep on a slight mound. So actually, there's space you have to, for every elephant almost, design a mound that would make them comfortable in each of the houses. So that's how we got the site. That's what the site looks like now. In two years, with two monsoons, just with the water trapping there, uh, and some indigenous species, it's transformed the whole area. Uh, families have started moving in, and by creating these verandas and courtyards, they have a lot of more space because they naturally cook in the outside because of the smoke. This is just low-cost housing, and so it's being adapted and changed in interesting ways. Uh, and the, 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 the bond between the mahut and the uh, elephant is very, very critical. Uh, it's a very complex thing. And so the water now adds this amazing dimension because they bathe together. And that's how they bond. And unless they bond, they can't operate because the elephant can get pretty violent. So the water then becomes critical. And this is how when we, they built the houses, we made that one hole. And in two years, this entire environment has changed. It's sort of beginning to attract birds. Uh, the trees are beginning to grow the reeds, but more importantly, it creates a whole new social condition for this really poor communi community to operate. But not only that, the well-being of the elephant, their health has changed dramatically as a result of this. And what, what really happened was that uh, that we just dug the hole, so you see the instable sand. Uh, and this is what happened when it, before anyone came in there, because we dug the hole, the water came in, the houses were built, and now the government has given us money, and we are using local labor to create these contoured landscapes with the local stones, so that as the water falls, they become ramps that the elephants can enter. So you're going to have a whole landscape here, which will be all water. There are going to be three large water bodies. In, in doing that, of course, one has transformed the area. You've served a pure, poor community. We also learned a lot, and while I was in Jaipur, I was fascinated by this little hut, which is a water cooler. The government sets this up every year, and you see the guy going in there, uh, and he sits there, uh, and he pours water from that kettle to anyone who comes by to drink it, because the temperature here goes to 45 degrees centigrade in the summer. And so this is a service the government puts together every summer. And this little hut is cooled by evaporation. So once in a while, the guy comes out, and he just sprinkles a little water on the hut to cool the hut. And the temperature of the water stays at about 20 degrees. Uh, and within it, you have earthen pots, which also 
cool by evaporation. So the process of just passive cooling by evaporation at a very low cost supplies water to hundreds of people every day at, 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 at almost nothing. And so using that almost as an inspiration, we were asked to design a building in Hyderabad where we, we took this inspiration of evaporative cooling, of using low technology like this uh, to achieve what we thought would be a kind of example of a sustainable design. And so this lets the light filter in. And so we came up with a building for an infrastructure company uh, which wanted a glass block because that is the image of, uh, of corporate India. Uh, but what we did, and this is a, a high-tech city in Hyderabad, the circular building is by Mario Botta. These are really IT buildings in, 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 in glass, largely, and our site was in the red. And we took the inspiration of the hut and looked at the architecture of impatient capital, which is now under threat. So the nets that, the, the nets that you see, the fish nets that you see, now come with the curtain glazing because this is very susceptible to people throwing stones during riots and breaking them. And so the nets actually now secure this impatient capital and its architecture. So by combining these two, we came up with a building which is not a green wall, it's a green screen which has a misting system. It is a spec wall with openable windows that you can and cool. Of course, we didn't get a LEED certificate for this because we didn't meet any of the requirements, but I believe it really works well. Uh, and so it has a podium with the parking. It has water bodies, which recycle the water for the cooling of the building. Uh, there are gardens. Each facade is imagined as a different facade with different flowers, so it'll be dynamic. Uh, and it has a trellis system, which we handmade in a little village using a lot of labor, and it has a sandblasted finish. Uh, that's what it looks like with the trellis. It looks like with the plants growing on it. Uh, and what is important also is the gardeners now on every floor interact visually with the corporate people in there. So you soften the threshold between people serving the building and people operating, and 20 gardeners look after this. Uh, and of course, the interiors are designed, the flowers are beginning to bloom, uh, and the misting system can be put on at different levels uh, for different species uh, in, order to, uh, in order to cool the building. And it's on a circuit, and it's on, you know, it can be controlled depending on what plants and what temperature sort of exists there, uh, and simulates sort of rain. And just sort of to end, I'll just summarize in a minute. I'm sorry I'm over time. So I think the challenges for us are how the minority world and the majority world begin to interface and teach each other. And I think the recognition of the fact that innovation is happening in the minority world only uh, is problematic. It's not a matter of just universalizing it, but it's a matter of how those paradigms might actually grow out of the majority world. I mean, all our urban planning theory came out of the industrializing West. Now we are applying those same theories back to the new world, and I think we should be evolving new theories. And so I think when Schumacher wrote Small is Beautiful, he ended the book by saying if the world was like he described it, he would be writing a book that's called Big is Beautiful. So it's not a matter of them being mutually exclusive, but I think we need to think locally, uh, think globally and act locally, not think locally and have the power to act globally because that's problematic. And I think, I think lastly, it's about uh, designers having to sup supplement their impulsive drive for grand solutions to more humble, nimble, and truly intelligent forms of design thinking that is moving from grand vision to grand adjustment. Thank you very much. <laughs>